I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. Iran's president raises tension even higher in the Middle East as bishops from the region continue their meetings at the Vatican. Is it a miracle in Manitoba? People there think so. To me, if I don't come here, it's just like I'm missing something. <laughs> and sending men a new message. We'll hear what one expert has to say. Talking about gender equality and those issues need to start much earlier than college. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, just when you think it could not get any more tense in the Middle East, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad wrapped up his two-day visit to Lebanon. It was a trip marked with a lot of fiery words, words that had Israel answering back. CNN's Arwa Damon is in Lebanon with more. Ahmadinejad arrived to a hero's welcome as Lebanese army helicopters circled overhead. Just a short distance away from neighboring Israel, he delivered a fiery speech telling people they were the heroes of the resistance against the Israeli enemy. And he called out to the cheering crowds for Israel's defeat. And Ahmadinejad vowed that Iran would forever stand by Lebanon and the resistance. The area especially is significant because it is here where Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah delivered his victory speech in 2000 after Hezbollah boasts it drove the Israeli army out of most Lebanese lands it occupied. Ahmadinejad's trip has been highly controversial, not just internationally, but domestically as well. Several parties in the government here are critical of Hezbollah and its control over a non-state militia, saying the visit is an indication that Lebanon is now Iran's base in the Mediterranean. Historically, Lebanon has been a proxy battlefield for major international players. More and more, according to analysts, it is becoming Iran's front line in its defining conflict with Israel. President Ahmadinejad's first visit has reaffirmed Iran's role in the region, a key influence in Lebanon's political fabric, a powerful player that cannot be isolated or left out of any equation. Well, that is CNN's Arwa Damon reporting from Lebanon. And Ahmadinejad's trip comes as bishops from the Middle East continue to meet for their two-week synod at the Vatican. Well, they're only in week one now with still much more to discuss. And to talk more about it with us is Rocco Palmo, the blogger of Whispers in the Loja. He's a current contributor as well. And he's joining us now by phone. Rocco, thanks so much for being here with us. What's the big news there from the synod so far? Well, I think the big news is more just that... Um, you know, it's something that the Vatican's wanted to highlight for a long time, that this, you know, uh, working for the good of Christians in the Middle East and for the good of all society in the Middle East is a team effort. It's not something that, you know, the um, Christian minority in the Middle East can do on its own. And, and uh, you know, really it's just a way of kind of getting everybody together to figure out the best way of, of going about it. And uh, it, it's funny because, you know, uh, as no synod ever has before. A rabbi has spoken in a synod before, and that happened again this time. But there were also yesterday two Muslim representatives, uh, uh, an Ayatollah from Iran uh, at the Vatican, believe it or not, and uh, also one from Lebanon representing the two branches of Islam. And Rocco, with Ahmadinejad in Lebanon now and some of the tensions in the Middle East, how is that, if at all, actually affecting the synod at the Vatican now? Well, I think, uh, Francesca, it's kind of, you know, circled the wagons, if you will. It's kind of given everybody a sense of, of common purpose. But even uh, even beyond that, uh, you know, I mean, there was a t really um, incredible paragraph from one of the um, Muslim leaders yesterday. He said, there is no Christian suffering uh, or, or Jewish suffering or, uh, you know, no individual group suffers in the Middle East. We all suffer together. And so it's, again, there's a real sense of, of solidarity surrounding this gathering. And uh, it's, you know, but at the same time, too, you know, so much of the, the tension, if you will, hasn't been external but internal in the church. You've had, you know, the patriarchs of different rights calling for, uh, for them to have uh, election rights for a pope to be included with the College of Cardinals in a conclave since the pope is the head of the whole church, and even calling for the ordination of more married men, which several Latin rite bishops present have said that they wouldn't mind. Of course, that's the Eastern tradition. Yeah. Now, there also Christian persecution in the Middle East has been something that's, that's been kind of top of mind there. Tell me a little bit about uh, uh, what the discussions have been as far as that goes. Well, you know, Matt, the, um, that was all, uh, 
persecution of Christians was always going to be high on the agenda, but it, it became even higher. Right on the eve of the synod, there were uh, 12 Filipino Catholics having mass with the priest in Saudi Arabia, and they were arrested on proselytism charges. This was, uh, and this wasn't in public, it was in, in, in a hotel room. Um, but that kind of, you know, underscored the tensions uh, that Christians have to undergo there. Um, but basically, again, you know, it's this kind of cry saying, we can't do this on our own. We can't have our life on our own. You know, one organization that's really involved in building the church uh, in the Middle East are the Knights of the Holy Sepulcher, who are, you know, uh, represented this week. And and so it's just a kind of wake-up call for the rest of the church. This is so important. This is the place where the faith was born. So let's, let's uh, you know, really kind of, you know, rally everybody to, to doing everything we can to help them out. Well, Rocco, we know the Synod's already met for the first week, and looking ahead into the next week, uh, what do you think that they're going to be looking at uh, coming up? Um, well, I think next week really becomes, you know, the second, this is a short synod as they go. They used to be a month long, and now this one's half the length. So next week, we'll see the body formulate the proposals, uh, the things which, you know, are going to be presented, uh, voted on, then presented to the Pope to come out with the final message of the synod. The final message of the synod is always a very moving document because it's, you know, bishops and other church leaders and even lay people from many places speaking as one, speaking as the voice of the church. Real quick, on a local note, one of the delegates of the synod is actually from Brooklyn. There are only seven U.S. bishops there, but the Maronite Church in the U.S. is based in Brooklyn, at least the eastern part. And so uh, the bishop, the Eppark, Gregory Monsour, is there. So, so that's how international it is. Even Brooklyn's at the synod. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Rocco, I understand you have a bus to catch. I would imagine it's not a bus to the Vatican, though. So, uh, no, can't really. <laughs> that those really don't work on water. The, so. I know. I know. You know, Jesus walked on water, but the buses can't float on water. So, <laughs> unfortunately, Thanks. yeah. Have a great, have a great weekend. Guys. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks for Rocco. your insights, Rocco. Take care. Anytime. All right, well, there's much more current straight ahead. When we come back, we'll have the day's headlines. Including the mine rescue in Chile has bishops there thanking God. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, what is a dysfunctional man? <laughs> I could name a couple for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out for sure. All right. Well, first, let's turn to the day's headlines. Do that one later. Chile's Catholic bishops say they are thankful to God for the safe rescue of the miners that were trapped underground for more than two months. In a statement released Thursday, the bishops said they joined millions of people around the world, including Pope Benedict, in praying for the miners throughout the ordeal. They also urged the faithful to continue praying for the 33 men and their families. Rescue crews originally estimated that they would not reach the men until December, but the last miner resurfaced on Wednesday night. In Turkey, the top Catholic bishop is publicly accusing Turkish ultra-nationalists of being involved in the murder of his predecessor. Bishop Luigi Padovesi was found stabbed to death at his home in June. His driver later confessed to the killing, but now the man who replaced Bishop Padovesi says the driver was not the only person involved. Bishop Ruggiero Franceschini told a Vatican meeting this week that the murdered bishop was the victim of a premeditated murder by ultranationalists and religious fanatics. Lawyers for the driver say the confessed killer acted alone for personal, not for political or religious region, reasons, and has mental problems. Northern England's last remaining Catholic semin seminary could close in a few months. The trustees of Ushaw College recently announced a plan to shut down the school by spring of 2011. The school dates back to the year 1568. It saw enrollment as high as 400 students in the 1950s, but now the school has just 26 students. If Ushaw shutters, England will have three seminaries remaining. Come on down, you've won a new car. Well, that's probably not a statement that you would associate with the Florida pastor who made headlines last month after planning to set fire to Korans on 9-11, but that is exactly what happened. He did win a new car. A New Jersey car dealer offered to give Pastor Terry Jones a new car if he would cancel the Koran burning event, and the dealer says he plans to keep that promise. Former New York Giants player Brad Benson owns a Kia dealership in South Brunswick, New Jersey, and made the offer on one of his radio ads. The pastor's representative called him to collect the car, and Pastor Jones told the Associated Press he does not plan to keep the car for himself. 
Well, in Canada, something unusual is happening at a Ukrainian Catholic church. Believers in Winnipeg say a, a cross that's inside that church appears to be oozing oil. Nicole Dubé reports. In a tomb inside St. Joseph's Ukrainian church, there's something happening that some call a miracle. Behind the sarcophagus of Catholic Bishop Blessed Vasse, an oily substance is weeping from a cross. It was an, uh, a wetness that came down from about here to about here. Mary Jane Kalinchuk is the shrine caretaker. She says the liquid appeared a month ago on the cross, which is made of steel. Something is occurring. Something is happening. But right now, we really can't explain it. Whatever the explanation, pilgrims from around the world are flocking to the martyr's shrine. This honor to just be in, in his presence. And, and uh, to me, if I don't come here, it's just like I'm missing something. <laughs> Over 20,000 people have come here since it opened in 2001. The bishop suffered years of torture in a Soviet concentration camp. He was released and died in Winnipeg in the 1970s. His is one of only two such shrines in Canada. And this is not the first time it's been associated with unexplainable events. I could use the word miracle, but that's more of a technical term already. That to, usually miracles are, have to be approved before they're declared miracles. I would say graces from God that, of healings that have taken place, cancer, cancer healings. What has happened here is open for interpretation. No new liquid has appeared on the cross, but the church is watching it closely, and they are contemplating whether or not to contact the Vatican to investigate. Whether the church would ever recognize them as miracles. It, there's a whole process there that's involved. But it would be another step on Vasse's path to being made a saint. That is Nicole Dubé in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Well, on to the Vatican now, where Pope Benedict will canonize six new saints on Sunday. We get a preview from Rome Reports. With the canonizations of October the 17th, the number of saints proclaimed by Pope Benedict XVI stands at 29. The oldest to be canonized is the Polish priest Stanislaw Soltis, who was born in the year 1433. He was professor of philosophy and theology and was known for his devotion to the Eucharist and for giving wonderful homilies. The second oldest is the Italian nun Battista Verano, who was born in 1458. She was the daughter of a noble but decided to renounce everything and devote herself to religious life. Another is the Italian religious Giulia Salzano. Born in 1846, she founded the Order of the Catechist Sisters of the Sacred Heart. Also raised to the altars is Australia's first saint, Sister Mary McKillop, who founded the Order of the Sisters of St. Joseph of the Sacred Heart, dedicated to educating poor children and to helping the needy and the outcasts of society. She knew what it was to be a migrant, and Australia has many migrants with a lot of loneliness and isolation and sadness. She also knew what it was like to be homeless because her father wasn't able to keep up paid work. She knew what it was to have the media after her and sometimes not very nice. So she had a lot of difficulties during her life, but she was a very happy, contented person because of her great love for God. So I think what we are saying to the people today is she would understand your problems. Brother Andre, Canadian religious of the Congregation of the Holy Cross, is also one of the new saints. He lived between 1845 and 1937. He worked as a shoemaker, baker and a farmer. He had the gift of healing the sick, so they started calling him the Miracle Man of Montreal. He had frail health and he was not schooled other than to read and write, uh, taught by his mother. Uh, but the novice master said, this fellow prays well and he'll be able to teach other people to pray. So he recommended that he be, make his vows as a professed brother of Holy Cross. And in fact, that's what happened. The Pope also declares holy the Spanish nun Candida Maria de Jesus Chipitria and Bariola, who was born in 1845. She's famous in Spain for founding the Congregation for the Daughters of Jesus in Salamanca, an order dedicated to teaching young people. 
And finally, one public school in Colorado Springs recently banned students from wearing rosaries to class, and the Catholic Diocese there supports that ban. The Diocese of Colorado Springs says local gang members have reportedly been wearing rosaries as a sign of their gang involvement, and the ban on rosaries is meant to protect the children. The principal says his school respects all religious beliefs, but told students they would be charged with a dress code violation if they were seen wearing a rosary. Well, stay tuned. We have more on the rosary coming up. Just ahead, do real men pray the rosary? We'll find out. Welcome back. Well, as a lot of Catholics know, October is the month of the Rosary, dedicated to encouraging more practice of this devotion. And you're about to meet someone who is encouraging it among one group in particular, men. <laughs> That's right. David Calvillo is the founder of an apostolate called Real Men Pray the Rosary. It's dedicated to promoting spirituality through the Rosary. And since, as you just said, October is the month of the Rosary after all, it seemed like a good time to chat with him about his work. Take a look. David, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Always, always ready to promote the rosary with conviction. There you go. There you go. Well, that's exactly what your uh, apostolate is about, the apostolate that you work with is about. Tell me a little bit about it. And, of course, this is the month of the rosary, the month of October. So tell me a little bit about your organization, what you're doing, and why the month of October is so important. Well, Real Men Pray the Rosary is, a, is a, uh, an apostolate that uh, my wife and I formed on the Feast of the Annunciation in 2009. And our mission statement is very simple but elegant, um, not because of anything we did to, to draft it, but because we took it directly from Pope John Paul II's uh, apostolic letter of 2002. Um, and the mission statement is basically to promote the rosary and confidently take it up in the light of Scripture, in harmony with the liturgy, and in the context of our daily lives. Um, that is our mission statement, but I guess we would add a little bit to that and say, especially uh, to us knuckle-headed men that sometimes need a little, uh, little extra nudging. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, why focus specifically on men with uh, praying the rosary here? Well, uh, the, the gist of it is, and what I, what I generally tell people when I, when I give a talk on, on our apostolate is that um, I was of the, of the notion that the rosary was for old ladies and funerals. <laughs> and uh, and that, that was where I began, that's where I ended, uh, until I went to a retreat back in 2008, and um, I experienced something that I had never felt before, and that was something that emanated from the rosary. I, I felt this connection. I felt this connection with God. I felt this connection with my mom. I felt this connection with these other 80 other men that, uh, that were there praying the rosary with me on that day in that retreat, and that started... Um, uh, something in me it kind of transformed that seed that had been planted by my by my mom and uh, and uh, over time I, I uh, studied everything I could get my hands on relating to the rosary and and this apostle it was formed because I I know I just know that there are other men out there that felt like I did that uh, that the rosary was just for old ladies and funerals and I wanted to help show them that um, that it could be a lot lot more mm -hmm. Well, what do you find that men particularly get out of praying the rosary on a regular basis? Well, um, you know, we all have, we all have friends um, that, you know, maybe take us back to our past um, in times when, uh, when maybe we were hanging out with people that we shouldn't be hanging out with, but yet they, we and they still consider, the, uh, consider ourselves friends of each other. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those, those friends have bad habits and habits that are not good for us habits that we know we shouldn't be around, but yet when we're with those particular friends, we find ourselves, um, we find ourselves kind of eking back into those, into those bad habits. And, uh, and again, to borrow the words of, uh, of, of Pope John Paul II and the idea that he laid out in that rosary, you know, if we pray the rosary daily, what we're doing is we're hanging out with Jesus and Mary every day. And, and it's, it's much more difficult to slip into those bad habits when we're hanging out with those two every day, which is what you do when you pray the rosary. You're meditating on those mysteries, those gospel mysteries every day, and you can't help but have that, you know, impact you in a very positive way. And so, so yeah, just, uh, you know, hang, uh, select your peer group by praying the rosary every day, and, and things will be better. 
Great, wonderful. Well, David Calvillo, the founder of Real Men Pray the Rosary, thank you so much for joining us. We'll link folks up on our blog to some more information, your uh, website, your Facebook page as well, right there on our blog uh, on our website. Thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Not a bad couple of characters to hang out with. There you go. <laughs> That's what he said. You know, you can't really get into trouble if you're hanging out with Jesus and Mary. I guess you're probably right. But, you know, he said something toward the beginning there that I think is probably uh, very true that a lot of people, I think especially men and younger people too, probably have the idea that the rosary is kind of just for, you know, little old ladies or something or just for funerals, like he said. So I think trying to break through that is probably not a bad thing for a lot of believers out there. I mean, this is something that's very important in a lot of people's lives, and it's been that way for a long time. He's just saying, you know, there's a reason for that, and uh, here's the reason, you know. Right, right. Well, I know we uh, also talked to Bishop DiMarzio about praying the rosary, and it's interesting to see that he has a very specific group. He's really looking at men and seeing how they can, uh, you know, pray the rosary more often, and that he found this at a retreat. And so with 80 other people there doing it together, he found the strength to then start this group, and obviously there is some power in that because he was able to go on and do his ministry this way. There you go. Well, I've posted some more information about Real Men Pray the Rosary over on our blog, just head to CurrentsNY.net and click on Riding the Wave. Stay with us. We'll be right back. When we return, changing the attitudes of dysfunctional men. This is a problem. This is not as it should be. It's not normal. It's not okay. Well, we've talked about how October is the month of the rosary, but it is also a month for raising awareness about a quite alarming and widespread problem. That's domestic violence. By one account, one out of four women is a victim of domestic abuse at some point in her life. And it comes to 1.3 million women a year just in the United States. Yeah, so where does this come from, this problem? A, a, lot of, a lot of it may have its roots in you know, media and popular culture, that sort of thing. That's what a lot of people think anyway. And last night at St. Francis College, filmmaker Thomas Keith explored that and more with a glimpse at masculinity called The Manual for Building Dysfunctional Men and How to Make Repairs. My film takes up mainly the way men are trained to think about women, the way men are trained to think about women in today's society and culture. This is not an anti-male film. This is a pro-male film. An anti-male film would be one where we tell men, just keep doing everything exactly as you're doing it now. Because we're, you know, we're not, the numbers aren't very good if you look at the lives of boys and men and the way we're doing things now. As the film pointed out, violence against women is really at its highest point in college. Very prevalent on college campuses. It's a whole way of life and it's accepted. And somehow we have to interfere with that acceptance. So I think that films like this, I think classes about gender, um, I think they help both young men and women uh, realize that this is a problem, this is not as it should be, it's not normal, it's not okay. I was so pleased and grateful that he came and he shared his work with us. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about and he, all the points that he brought up were valid and they are very current. When you try to raise your voice against whatever negative things are being said about women or s sexist you know, attitudes, there's a fight back, oh you're a feminist, you're an angry person, the enemy in a way. Is it an affront or an attack upon your masculinity to think about these things? You know what I mean? Somehow, well if I start thinking about sexism and women's issue then that somehow emasculates me in some way. I think that men aren't part of the conversation enough and I agree with him when he says that we really need to look at men and boys and how boys are being raised and uh, what kinds of models of masculinity uh, are out there. I think that talking about gender equality and those issues need to start much earlier than college. I think it ought to be started, you know, when, when kids are probably 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, we should start talking about this. Why are guys so drawn to the most vulgar and violent forms of, of you know, media, of sexist media? I also very much agree with the, with the film on this, that this is not a black issue, this is not a Latino issue. Uh, across the board, whatever your race is, this is happening. The movie was pretty scary in a lot of ways, because, you know, sometimes we tend to forget about these things for the day, like, 
we just want to get through our day and not think about any violence at all. But when you see something like this, it really is a wake-up call to reality. The film itself, you may have noticed, is, is mainly a secular message in the sense that I'm just talking about the harms that we do to ourselves, the harms that um, are being created in our society to both men and women. And I think both the, the secular and the religious side um, can, can get behind that. Like, I'm making films not for people who look like me. You know what I'm saying? Middle-aged white people. I'm making films for young people because the only way we're going to change anything is if your generation catches fire and makes it happen. Pretty powerful message there. Yeah, very powerful. And it's great that the discussion is happening and that, you know, he's out there spreading the word about this and saying, you know what, it's not okay that these things are happening, you know, and trying to make that, that cultural change and at least make people aware that, that this is happening and it's not okay. And as he said, the education of men needs to start a lot earlier in their lives to say, you know, you need to respect women and, and respect others in general, but especially respect women throughout your life. Well, a lot of things happen, I think, because there isn't the right modeling around them. And then yeah. the messages that they do get sent, people, young people of both sexes, but especially young men, that are very insidious messages, aren't really ones that are of respect. And so minus the modeling and minus that societal message that they're getting, they're sort of left with, you know, what what can we do? And sort of fending for themselves. And, you know, he started some of that piece with uh, some of the music video that was in there. Yeah. Again, you know, depicting some images of women that really aren't that terrific. So yeah. I guess what we're trying to really do is look at uh, each person as, as worthy of respect and to try and treat people with respect at a fundamental level. Absolutely, that, that is the goal. Well, and that is it for tonight's show. Remember, we're always online over at CurrentsNY.net. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night and enjoy your weekend.